A sagacious mother-in-law possesses the ability to reignite a dwindling family hearth from a mere ember in her son's home, whereas an imprudent one has the potential to snuff out even the most ardent flames of affection. Traditional Adage Alexandra resided with her parents in the outskirts of Vancouver, Canada, where they had emigrated from Yugoslavia. The young girl experienced a relatively ordinary upbringing. She matured from a joyful child into an exceptionally tall, bright, and captivating young lady who could enchant anyone. It surprised no one when she chose to compete in the Miss Canada beauty pageant in 1985. Alexandra truly stood out from the other contestants. She never struggled to form friendships and drew men to her even more rapidly. Even a few high-ranking officials were among Alexandra's admirers. The beauty queen's appeal to the opposite sex was not solely based on her appearance. Her friendly personality and fantastic sense of humor also played a crucial part. Alexandra worked as a dental assistant, a job that was not her passion or aspiration, but rather something her parents supported. Her mother and father thought this career would offer her the necessary financial stability. The girl had a close bond with her mother. They always shared a fantastic relationship, frequently shopping together, conversing on the phone daily, and attending local open house events on weekends. At one such event, the women overheard someone nearby speaking their native tongue. Meeting compatriots in a foreign land is always pleasant, and they felt compelled to get to know these individuals better. The mother and daughter approached the couple and initiated a conversation. The man and woman introduced themselves as the p It emerged that Sam and Yelka, as they were known, had also migrated to Canada from Yugoslavia, and Yelka was close in age to Alexandra's mother. The women had comparable backgrounds and were equally thrilled to meet someone from their home country, so they immediately connected. As the future friends reminisced about life in Yugoslavia and discussed their experiences, Alexandra mentioned having car issues. By chance, the P6 owned an auto repair shop. The couple insisted that she bring her car to them for quality service at a fair price. They described the shop's location and advised her to ask for Joe, who would ensure everything was done to the highest standard. Joe, the 27-year-old son of P6 and Jelka, was, like most people, utterly enchanted by Alexandra and hoped that her son would also notice the girl. It all unfolded exactly like that. When Alexandra brought her car in for service and inquired about Joe, a young, handsome man appeared. It was love at first sight. From the moment the young people met, they were virtually inseparable. Both had a taste for fine dining and frequently visited the best restaurants in town. Joe rode a motorcycle and took Alexandra on romantic rides. It wasn't long before they couldn't imagine being apart. Their families were also very happy for the young couple. Jelka was delighted to get along with her son's girlfriend, and even more, she was proud of herself for finding the perfect woman for Joe. Alexandra was beautiful, intelligent, they shared the same culture, and the girl came from a family with values very similar to their own. Alexandra's parents also liked Joe. They saw how lovingly and respectfully he treated their daughter. The guy regularly visited her with flowers or cute trinkets. Just a month after meeting, Joe proposed to Alexandra, and she joyfully accepted. They were about the same age, both had immigrated from Yugoslavia, had similar interests, and despite the brief period of acquaintance, both felt deep emotions for each other. They anticipated a long, happy married life ahead. It seemed destiny had brought this couple together. Unfortunately, this chance encounter would lead to the exact opposite outcome. Everything would end not at all as they had envisioned. Following the engagement, Alexandra was elated with joy, but her state of bliss was continually disrupted by her future mother-in-law, Jelka, who desired to be slightly more involved in organizing the wedding than was necessary. The issue was that the woman rejected nearly all of the suggestions Alexandra made and persistently pushed her own opinions regarding the ceremony. The bride was not willing to concede either. The tastes of the two women differed significantly in this regard. Each had her own perfect vision, which led to some disagreements between them. Jelka was very self-assured and believed her opinion was the only correct one. 
She preferred the dress she had selected for Alexandra much more than the one the bride had chosen for herself, and she expressed this aloud. The women disagreed about the floral arrangements for the hall, the festive menu, the decor of the chairs, the tablecloths, everything that needed to be decided. The future mother-in-law believed that the bride should value her opinion and her contribution as the groom's mother in planning such a momentous event. But this upset Alexandra because she envisioned her wedding differently. Furthermore, she was even more upset by the fact that Joe apparently wasn't bothered by his mother's interference, and he never once spoke up in defense of Alexandra. The guy couldn't help but notice that Jelka was putting his future wife in an uncomfortable position, but he pretended everything was fine and simply remained silent. In fact, Alexandra did not want to argue with Jelka, did not want to create problems in the family, and dreamed of making everything peaceful and calm. She tried to talk to Joe and asked for his support, to which her boyfriend promised to talk to his mother and persuade her not to interfere in the preparations. Alexandra relaxed a bit, but Joe's words had no effect. Jelka did not calm down. It reached the point where the girl began to wonder whether she should even participate in this wedding and if she had rushed into it, as marriage is for life. However, her parents then intervened. They reassured their daughter that perhaps Jelka was too excited about her only son getting married, which is why she was showing excessive care. This somewhat calmed Alexandra, and she once again immersed herself in the pre-wedding preparations. On June 11, 1988, Joe and Alexandra officially united their families. It was a truly beautiful day for the two lovers, and even Jelka behaved decently, as befits a happy mother. The newlyweds spent their honeymoon in Hawaii, and everything went wonderfully, but when they returned from their wedding trip, Alexandra realized that unfortunately, her parents were mistaken about Jelka. The mother-in-law's behavior was not just due to excitement about the event, it had worsened. Her interference in Joe and Alex's family relationships only intensified, and once they combined their finances, the girl realized that her mother-in-law's intrusiveness was much worse than she had thought. Joe still worked for his parents at their auto shop, which was normal. But in addition to his salary, the guy also received instructions on how to spend the money he earned. It turned out that his parents completely controlled his budget. Maybe this made sense when he was a young single man, but now that Joe had a wife, such interference should have ceased. However, it didn't. His mother and father were too deeply involved in their son's life, and now in Alexandra's life because she was married to him. The girl again tried to talk to her husband about cutting the umbilical cord and becoming an adult, living independently from his parents. But Joe saw nothing wrong with it, which greatly repelled Alexandra, especially since his mother and father presented the newlyweds with a lavish gift, money for the down payment to buy their own home where they could live and raise their children. This would have been wonderful if not for one caveat. Joe's parents had already chosen a house for them, and it was located just a couple of houses away from their own. This was a condition Jelka set before making the gift. To get the money for the down payment, the young couple had to buy this particular house. Any other dwelling Joe and Alexandra could purchase independently with their own finances. Eventually, the newlyweds decided to accept the gift on these terms, and Alexandra immediately had to pay for this decision. Jelka constantly came into the house without warning. She herself bought groceries, chose clothes for her daughter-in-law based on her own preferences, and was not at all embarrassed that this did not match Alexandra's personal style. Jelka tried to actively participate in the decoration and furnishing of the new house and openly expressed her disdain for what Alexandra chose. She could easily rearrange small items in the house to her own taste. The irritation of the wife, as in most families, spilled over onto her husband, making Joe's home life a bit uncomfortable. And at work, he listened to his mother's complaints, frankly not understanding why Alex treated her poorly. After all, Yelka was just trying to help. Finally, Joe got tired of it all and took his wife's side. For the first time, the man stood up for his wife and asked his mother to step back a little. He didn't speak to his mother for weeks when she refused to respect the boundaries he was trying to set. But over time, 
Joe began to resent Alexandra for the fact that his relationship with his parents had deteriorated. The man felt torn between the two women. It was the first very difficult year of marriage for Alexandra and Joe. Their love and devotion to each other were put to a serious test. In the end, they reached a point where there was some space between Alexandra and Jelka, and although the women saw each other much less often, there was still a lot of resentment between them. At the end of 1989, a year and a half after the wedding, Alexandra and Joe made an exciting announcement to the family that they were expecting a child. As expected, throughout the pregnancy, there were moments when Yelka overstepped her boundaries, giving unsolicited and unwanted advice about the baby, but for the most part, she tried to be nice. It wasn't as intrusive as it was during the wedding planning, so Alex was grateful to her for that. Soon, a happy Joe and Alexandra welcomed the birth of their son, Brandon. They were both navigating a new path as young parents, and after months of long, sleepless nights and very stressful days associated with having a baby in the house, Joe decided to arrange a romantic evening for his wife to spend time alone with her. He talked to his mother, and the woman persuaded her son to leave Brandon with her. Alexandra prepared a couple of bottles and also told Jelka about the baby's feeding schedule. Her mother-in-law said she would brew her grandson some tea brought from their home country to help him fall asleep faster in the evening. But Alexandra convinced her to just stick to the usual schedule and limit herself to milk. She didn't know if the child would have any side effects to this tea, and now was clearly not the time to check, so she asked Jelka to avoid any improvisations. The woman agreed, but she had raised Joe and knew how to feed children better than anyone else. So when it was time to go to bed, Jelka still gave little Brandon some of that tea, and the boy fell into a deep sleep. As soon as Alexandra and Joe returned home from their date, the young mother immediately went to the nursery to kiss her son. The child was sleeping so deeply that Alex could not wake him up. She picked him up, and again there was no reaction to either voice or touch. Brandon was breathing but unconscious, his pulse barely palpable, and that's when Jelka admitted that she had given him the tea. The situation greatly alarmed Alex. She was afraid that her child might be in some danger. The woman took the baby to the emergency room, where he was examined by doctors. Brandon regained consciousness, but Alexandra was furious that Jelka had ignored her warning. After that, she didn't want to leave the boy alone with his grandmother at all, which greatly offended Joe's mother. The child's father himself was neutral about the situation. Alex was disappointed by her husband's indifference, and this was the last straw for her. She couldn't go on living like this and didn't want to raise Brandon in a stressful environment, so she took the baby, packed her things, and left for her parents' house. Meeting with a divorce lawyer, Alexandra explained that the Pisic family posed a threat to her child. Jelka had given the baby some strange tea, and Joe refused to do anything and fight for the safety of his own son. The entire family was shocked when Joe received the divorce papers. The parents initially accused Alexandra of purposely marrying a member of a wealthy family in order to then run away with a portion of their fortune. But in reality, they were not that rich, and this statement made no sense. Alexandra loved Joe and wanted it to somehow impact her husband. However, deep down, she knew that he would never stand up to his parents and prioritize her and Brandon in his life. Relations between the families deteriorated very quickly, and a fierce battle for custody ensued. In addition, the couple clashed over the right to own the house and finances. Joe challenged almost every request from Alexandra, and his mother was by his side throughout the trial. Jelka relied on the fact that it was the Pisic family who made a significant down payment when buying the house. But that did not help. Ultimately, Alexandra was awarded full custody of Brandon, child support, and ownership of the house. In November 1991, the divorce was finalized. Jelka considered this act the greatest betrayal of her son and harbored resentment. For the first time in the last two years, Alexandra felt free. Her situation was not perfect, but she finally got rid of the constant stress and unnecessary drama. Everything went back to the way it was before meeting Joe. The woman still worked in the dentist's office, and on weekends she spent time with her mother and friends. Only now, a tiny person appeared next to her, 
giving her the strength to move forward. Joe also went on as before. He continued to work in his parents' auto shop and adapted to life without Alexandra. One day, the divorced woman received an envelope addressed to her in the mail with no return address. Inside was a book titled The Death of Cindy James, which told the story of the investigation into the death of a young girl who repeatedly claimed to have been stalked and threatened for several months. She was found dead in the yard of an abandoned house with a nylon stocking wrapped around her neck. The girl's mysterious death became the subject of much controversy, as the police could not find any evidence of a violent nature, and many believed that Cindy had committed suicide. This story took place in Canada in 1989. Flipping through the book, Alexandra noticed that some passages were underlined. They described in detail the harassment and the terrifying nature of the threats addressed to Cindy. The book's heroine often received calls from an unknown person who either remained silent or whispered something indistinctly into the phone. The lawn in front of her house was littered with dead animals, and someone even set Cindy's house on fire. For the divorced woman, this message was completely obvious. She could end up in the place of the heroine. A few days after receiving the book, Alexandra invited a friend over. They were sitting in the living room and chatting when they suddenly smelled smoke and heard a crackling sound coming from outside. The friend rushed to the window and saw a tree in Alexandra's yard ablaze. This was one of the several things that had happened in Cindy's story. Alexandra was horrified and immediately turned to the police, but law enforcement could do little without evidence of who exactly had started the fire. Things only got worse from there. Alex felt like she had become the object of surveillance. The woman noticed that wherever she went, the same white car followed her everywhere. There was a similar episode in Cindy's story. One time, when Alexandra was spending time with her mother, the phone rang. As soon as the woman picked up the phone, she was told that the coffins for her and her mother were ready. All these episodes from the book, reproduced in reality, made Alex paranoid. She told her family and friends about it and was firmly convinced that it was Jelka's doing. She knew from the book that the persecution led to the heroine's death, and she was really scared. Unfortunately, the police were never able to link these incidents to the Pisik family. Unsatisfied with the authorities' responses, Alexandra decided to hire a private detective to watch her ex-husband's family and provide evidence. She knew perfectly well who could really organize this persecution. A few days later on August 5, 1992, at 6 p.m., Alexandra and her colleague left work and headed for the car in their work parking lot. Alex got behind the wheel, and her colleague Kirsten sat in the passenger seat. When the colleague leaned over to put his gym bag on the floor of the car, there was a pop. Kirsten instinctively lowered his head even lower, followed by a few more shots, and then there was the screeching of tires, the screams of passers-by, and some car quickly began to move away. The colleague carefully got out from under Alexandra, who had fallen on top of him. The woman's head was limply tilted to the side, and her clothes were already soaked with blood. Kirsten jumped out of the car and ran back to the dental office to call emergency services. Alexandra Pisik was taken to the hospital, but unfortunately, she did not survive the injuries. She was shot in the head several times. The deceased was only 25 years old. About 30 eyewitnesses testified to the police, hoping that they could help find the person who did it. The witnesses' stories matched completely. There were two dark-haired white men sitting in a bright red car. They were previously noticed circling the area shortly before 6 p.m., and then they stopped next to Alexandra's car. As soon as the young woman got behind the wheel, shots were fired and then the red car sped off the parking lot. One of the witnesses remembered the license plate number. After checking, the police found out that the car was reported stolen. After talking to Alexandra's loved ones, the detectives came to a completely obvious conclusion. This was not an accident. The young woman was a pre-planned target, and the Pisik family was the first on the list of potential suspects. Joe immediately provided an alibi. The man and his son, Brandon, were in a swimming pool several miles away from the crime scene. He had a receipt with the hours and minutes marked, 
confirming that he could not have been in the red car during the shooting. But for a person who had just learned about the death of his ex-wife, his behavior seemed very strange. Joe was too calm and showed no emotions. Therefore, despite having an alibi, the police did not exclude the man from the list of suspects. The private detective hired by Alexandra, having learned what had happened to her, turned to the officers leading the investigation and provided the information he had collected. On the day Alex was ambushed, the detective was watching Joe. The man picked up Brandon at 5 p.m. to go to the pool. Physically, he could not have been present at the crime scene. Jelka and her husband were at the family repair shop at this time, so they too were absent at the time of the attack. All these remarks only proved that physically, none of the P6 pulled the trigger. But this did not absolve them of responsibility for organizing the attempt. When Alexandra initially became concerned that someone was following her, she told the police the license plate number of the white car that drove everywhere after her. Detectives checked the number against the database and identified the person in whose name the car was registered. Milan Ninadik was a friend of the Pizik family and even attended Joe and Alexandra's wedding. The stolen red car was eventually found as well. One witness happened to notice two men getting out of the red car, moving into another white one, and driving away. The investigators managed to recover a fingerprint and find a hair inside the stolen car. Milan Ninadic's fingerprints were on file because of his previous criminal record, but they did not match those found in the red car, as they belonged to another petty criminal named Lawrence Delorme. Round-the-clock surveillance was established for these young men, and soon it yielded results. Just five days after Alexandra's death, Milan pulled up to the Pisic house, but he did not go inside. Instead, he went to Jelka's car and hid in the back seat. This looked very strange, but the police continued to keep watch. A couple of minutes later, Jelka appeared on the porch of the house. Looking around, she went to her car, got behind the wheel, and carefully started driving. Having parked at a shopping center, they got out of the car separately and disappeared inside, and then the two of them returned to the parking lot. Milan got back into the back seat, and Yelka settled into the driver's seat. The police were waiting for them right in the driveway of the Pisic house. When Milan Ninadic was being led out of the car, money fell out of the pocket of his shorts, $30,000 in cash. He and Yelka were immediately arrested on suspicion of organizing the attack on Alexandra. During a search of the house, a piece of paper with the name David Sigiviana and an address was found, and a gun and a box of cartridges were also discovered, in which six pieces were missing. The weapon matched the one used in the case, but DNA analysis on the gun did not reveal any matches with either Milan Ninadic or Lawrence Delorme. Apparently Delorme was the driver, Ninadic provided the car, and Yelka was the mastermind. But who was the shooter? The note helped to sort this out. The detectives went to the address, but the person with the specified name was not at home. However, they managed to take a sample of his DNA, and it turned out that it was his hair that was found in the cabin of the stolen car. The fingerprints on the gun also belonged to him, and David's girlfriend helped tie it all together. She agreed to wear a wire, and thanks to this, the detectives were able to obtain a recorded confession about what happened to Alexandra. This was just the evidence that was missing. When questioning the neighbors, the investigators learned even more incriminating information. One woman claimed that a few weeks before, she had seen Yelka set fire to a tree in Alexandra's yard. She also saw that Pisik had a copy of the book, The Death of Cindy James. Jelka was so disappointed in Alexandra that she personally passed sentence on her. She decided to recreate Cindy's story so that her daughter-in-law would know exactly what was in store for her. The woman hired David as a shooter and Lawrence as a driver. Milan Ninadic was the liaison and assistant to Pasek. The angry woman wanted Alexandra to say goodbye to her life in broad daylight in front of the public. The three men, together with Jelka, appeared in court in 1993. They were all found guilty of a particularly serious crime of the first degree and sentenced to the maximum possible punishment in Canada at that time, 25 years in prison. Joe and his father were never charged, as nothing indicated their involvement. 
the care of Alexandra's child Brandon fell on the shoulders of her mother. Joe Pisick never again claimed custody of his son and did not even try to contact him. Probably, the man felt his guilt for the death of Alexandra. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon.